as lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, we all have an inclination to the epitome of love. When we rejoice, when times are hard, whatever stage of life we are in, we all yearn to be in one special place. We all wish to visit the Blessed Shrine of Imam Al Hussein in the holy city of Karbala. Not all of us have the blessing to visit the shrine of Imam Hussein, but there is still a way to experience the sights and sound of the blessed land of Karbala in the comfort of your own homes. We call upon you, dear viewers, to support us in our financial costs to help bring the Holy Land of Karbala beaming into your homes. You can support us with a monthly donation of just 50 US dollars or 30 pounds. We are your gateway to Karbala. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Imam Hussein TV3. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh in Ramadan Kareem. The Imam Hussein Charity will be running its food basket campaign again this year, giving you the opportunity to help destitute and impoverished families throughout the whole of Iraq and Afghanistan. Each food basket contains essentials such as rice, flour, dried lemons, tea, fruits and vegetables, oil, tomato paste, dates, and much, much more. Each basket is 25 pounds and can feed a family of four for up to 10 days. You can feed a family of four for the whole of Ramadan for only 75 pounds. You can donate via bank transfer, PayPal, or visit us at www.imamsaincharity.com. والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم 
اللہ لا الہ الا هو الحی القیوم نزل علیک الكتاب بالحق مصدقا لما بین یدیه و انزل التورات والانجیل Is the Bible the word of God without a doubt is one of the most important questions when it comes to reconstructing and analyzing the biography and the life of Jesus son of Mary because we know very well that it's one of the most widespread books in human history wherever you go in the world you'll find that there is either a Bible in a particular hotel that you visited Or you may find a Bible as something that may have to be sworn by in the courtrooms. Or you'll find at least publishers and printers and booksellers will all have the Bible available for us to order. Of course, this was not necessarily the case when we go back 2,000 years. The textual variants that exist in the copies of the Bibles and the copies of the Gospels means that there is always a question mark concerning whether the Bible was the word of God or not. For Muslims, from a young age, as we mentioned last night, we're taught that the only word of God is the Qur'an, in the sense that there were revelations that were given in the past. We mentioned last night when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna anzalna at fiha We sent the Torah and within the Torah is what? Is guidance and is light. So Allah mentions the Torah as a form of guidance for mankind. And likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Injil. If you ask any of us what is Bible in Arabic, we always mention that Arabized word in the opinion of some from the Syriac or from the Ethiopian and that is the Injil. You find in the Quran Allah says وَآتَيْنَاهُ Injil," That we gave Jesus the Injil. Or in another ayah of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says بِسْمِ اللَّهَ الرَّحْمَانَ الرَّحِيمِ In Surah 3 verse number 48 وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْتَوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ That Allah teaches him the book, the wisdom, the Torah and the Injil. So why then do Muslims say the Quran is the only word of God? When Allah is saying that we taught Jesus son of Mary, the Torah and the Injil. And remember when the Quran was saying this, one of the biggest dilemmas that Muslims will always face is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the Torah and the Injil to the early Muslim community. Especially in Medina, the majority of times you'll find that the Injil is discussed is in Medina. In Mecca there is more of a discussion of God and the oneness of God and a discussion of proving oneness in contrast to polytheism but when you come to medinian society there is a mention of the torah and a mention of the injil last night we even went further in saying that there are discussions which mention very clearly that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example states to all of us where he says very clearly that you can look towards the torah and the injil and that the people of the injil are the ones who have to refer to their rulings. وَلْيَحْكُمْ أَهْلَ الْأَوْ أَهْلَ الْإِنْجِيلِ Let the people of the Injil, the people of the Bible, come together and judge by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. So, the Bible is mentioned. The Old Testament, New Testament, the Torah, the Injil, the Jewish Bible, the New Testament is all mentioned within the Quran. Question then, Why is it that Muslims do not necessarily believe that the Bible is God's word? Is there any verse in the Quran that says that the Bible has been changed completely where it specifically says that the Injil was changed and hence we gave you the Quran? Is there an ayah that says this? That the Bible was changed and we gave you the Quran? There's no ayah that actually says it. Yes, tahrif. And يحرفون الكلمة is mentioned in, for example, Surah Al-Ma'idah. But there is no ayah in the Quran that mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we changed and because of the change of the Bible, we gave the Quran. You found that the verses mentioned, for example, the Torah, the Injil, 
But when they mention the Torah and the Injil, next to the Torah or next to the Injil, there isn't a direct verse that says that the Injil was changed and therefore Allah gave Muslims the Quran. Although many of us from a young age, this is what we're taught in Muslim communities. And this question is vital. Why? Because I have to ask myself if the Bible is the word of God that we have with us until today, then why am I a Muslim? Am I a Muslim? Simply because my parents are Muslim, so I'm a Muslim. If my dad was called Krishna, then I'd be Hindu. And if my dad, for example, was called Raj, for example, I'd be Sikh. And if my dad was called Matthew, I might be Christian. Why am I a Muslim? It's because I believe in the Quran and I believe in the message of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. But then why don't I believe in the Bible? What's my argument against the Bible? What do I show from the Bible that has led me to believing the only uncorrupted, unaltered text of God is the Quran. Now, when I say this, of course, is the Bible the word of God and ask this question, I don't want to be arrogant towards the Christian community that watches this. Ultimately, I'm not a prophet of God sitting here for me to say that this book is the word of God or this book isn't. I can either approach this in an academic fashion where I look at some of the reasons why I, as a Muslim, may not take the Bible that is with me today as necessarily the word of God. I don't want to turn it around into a discussion where I look at the Christian community, for example, and say that all of you are doomed to hell and all of you are going to burn because your book is the wrong. No, it's a discussion that this book, the Bible, I attest to it in the Quran that the Jewish Bible and the New Testament, I attest that there may be a discussion of them within the Quran, within the discussions of the Torah and the Injil. But why is it that I as a Muslim do not necessarily believe that the Bible that we have today is necessarily the word of God? Why is it that I reject the idea that it's the word of God? Why is it that I differ with the idea that it's the word of God. What are the reasons? Listen, even you who are watching online or at home, if someone was to ask you, why do you not believe the Bible is the word of God? For which reason? What are your main answers that you would give? And that's why you'll find that this question is a question of the accuracy of the Bible, of the inerrancy of the Bible, of the question of what's the preservation of the Bible, because if today someone came to me, and by the way, this is a Christian belief. If someone today came to me and said to me that the church leaders decided a few centuries after Jesus died that these were the parts to be included in the Bible, would that give you confidence that the Bible is the word of God? I just want you to think about this, whether you're a Muslim or whether you're a Christian. The church leaders decided a few centuries after Jesus died, that these were the parts that could be collected and canonized as the Bible and the Word of God. If someone said that to me, it doesn't fill me with confidence. The reality is that there is too much human involvement in how the Bible was collected and preserved. Now, someone might turn around and say, but the Quran has a lot of human involvement as well. That's a good point. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or God, when he reveals the Quran, does the Prophet write the Quran? When Allah reveals the Quran, does the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, does he write the Quran or no? I want you to ask yourself these questions rather than be unfair to the Christians and the Bible. Does the Prophet write the Quran? No. So who writes the Quran? Quran we have with us today. Who is it written by? The Quran is written by companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who were sitting alongside him. The order of the revelation of God to prophets has always been along this line. God reveals to a prophet. That prophet either is one who, for example, writes or he may have certain disciples around him who are the ones who write. Up to this point, I have no issue that if I come with a conclusion that God reveals to Jesus 
and that Jesus, who's similar to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, in the fact that both of them are illiterate. When I say illiterate, I don't mean they don't know how to read or write. I mean that they were never formally taught by another human being how to read or write. Both of them never were known to have written in their lifetime. So now when I see this, I see that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, when God revealed to him the Quran, did the Prophet write the Quran? The Prophet did not write the Quran. Who wrote the Quran? Imam Ali alayhi salam. Was he living alongside the Prophet? Yes. Abdullah bin Mas'ud was living alongside the Prophet? Yes. Hudayf al-Yaman was living alongside the Prophet? Yes. Therefore, as a Muslim, my understanding of revelation is that God inspires or reveals to a Prophet those around the Prophet are the ones who are writing. If I can find a similarity with the Bible, then why can the Bible not be the Word of God? If I find with the Bible that God revealed His message to Christ, Christ does not write. There are those around Him who write, so is there a problem with me following the Bible if that is my conclusion? I have to now in my study and discussion try and understand is there a similarity between the way the Quran is revealed and the way the Bible supposedly was revealed. If I find that the people around Jesus were writing his dictations from the Lord, then what's the issue with me believing in the Bible? Why do I only believe in the Quran? But if I find, however, even when I come to the Qur'an, I have manuscripts of the Qur'an. If I see verses missing 20 years later, or verses added 300 years later, would I accept the Qur'an? I ask you. If I have a copy of the Qur'an, which has a story, for example, about a lady committing zina 100 years after the original Qur'an had none of that story, wouldn't I doubt the Qur'an? I'd say, hold on a minute, where did this story come in about adultery a few hundred years later? But it's not there in the original Qur'an. If I now look at my Qur'an, my Qur'an, I need to look at manuscripts. I want to see the textual variance, how much variation is there? Yes? Is there a lot of variation? If the Qur'an, now someone bought you a Qur'an from a thousand years ago, and it is missing six chapters from the Qur'an of today. Wouldn't you begin to doubt your own book? So therefore, I'm trying to now look at the Bible in this way. That if I believe in the Qur'an, that God inspires the Prophet, the Prophet has people around him. These are people who are companions. They write during the Prophet's lifetime what the Prophet said to them. And that there is a copy of the Qur'an from a thousand years ago, which is the same as the copies that I have today then I'll be confident the Qur'an is the word of God. If the same can apply to the Bible, then I'll be copy, uh, confident with the same. Therefore, tonight, when we're answering this question, is the Bible the word of God? I need to ask myself, maybe for the first time in my life, why have I rejected the Bible? And what was the methodology in which the Bible was revealed? And how do I answer the issues that we raised in last night's discussion because last night we raised a number of issues and i'd like to look at each of these issues tonight in answering the question is the bible the word of god or not last night we raised a number of questions what were they we said that in the quran there are certain christians who say that god in the quran has no problem with the bible because he keeps asking people to refer to the bible if God had a problem with the Bible when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family was alive, then why does God keep telling Ahlul Injil to go to their Bible? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْيَحْكُمْ أَهْلِ Injil," When Allah tells the people of the Bible, go and judge by that which Allah has sent. If the Bible has been changed, then how could Allah ask them to go and judge by that which Allah has sent? Or, if you look in another verse of the Qur'an we mentioned last night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he mentions, ذَلِكَ مَثَلُهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَمَثَلُهُمْ فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ Or, another of the arguments that we posited la last night, لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ 
So there is no one who can change the words of Allah. So how could you say the Bible was changed if no one can change? These arguments are arguments which are the first ones I'd like to address. As to whether the Bible is the word of God or no. How do we address them? Firstly, when the Quran says, let the people of the Injil judge by their books, there's a possibility that a, the people of the Injil were carrying with them the remnants of the Bible in its truest form. Yes, there is a belief that in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, there was still a group of Christians who could have been addressed by such a verse who were known as the Ebionites. Christians, there are many different groups of Christians. And one of the earliest groups were the Ebionites. The Ebionites, for example, were amongst the Christians who would have believed in one God, may not necessarily have believed, for example, in Jesus being the Son of God. They may not even have believed that Jesus was born from a virgin birth, but they certainly would have leaned more towards a monotheistic belief. So if the Quran is telling them, O oh, Ahlul Injil, O oh, people of the Injil, Go and judge by your book. On the first level, there may have been a group of Christians who had the teachings of Christ with them until today without those teachings being altered in any way. On the second level, what could the answer be? On the second level, it could also be that you may not have the complete version which has not been affected, but you've got enough within there that is enough for you to judge. Yes? I may have, for example, living in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, I'm one of the Ahlul Injil. I may be living in the time of the Prophet. Maybe the Bible that I have with me, maybe it has been affected by some tahrif. Because I cannot discount the, those verses that say, يحرفون الكلمة عن مواضعه. There is definitely an opinion of some sort of tahrif. Maybe. But is it enough for me not to be able to use the Bible? I ask you. Are there certain lines in the Bible which you'd say, an Imam would say, until today with us in the Bible? There are some lines in the Bible with us until today, which I wouldn't be surprised if someone like Imam Ali السلام, would say. They're beautiful lines. Does that mean that every line in the Bible has been affected by tahrif? Every single line? There are certain lines, for example, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor is a line which is affected by tahrif. When you say blessed are the poor, is that affected by tahrif? No. That shows that in the Bible, there are still certain instances where a person can still, as a Christian, live a very good life. Wallah, there are Christians in the world today who are better than Muslims. There are Christians in the world today whose mouths are not as filthy as the Muslim mouth. The Muslim mouth is happy doing la'na on everybody. The Muslim mouth is happy sending everybody to hell. The Muslim mouth is happy calling everybody Shimmer and Ibn Marjana and Yazid. The Muslim mouth enjoys attacking everybody, not praise. It loves to attack. There are Christians in this world, wallah, they're the most peaceful of people. They have the best of morals walking on this earth. But they have it because of the Bible, not because they've ever read the Quran. Does that mean therefore that I believe that the whole of the Bible that was present in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi came a few hundred years after Nabi Isa alayhi wa alayhi, the whole of the Bible has been affected? No, not necessarily. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Ahlul Injil that you should judge by what? That you should judge by the Bible? Because in the Bible there may be enough for them to judge by. How many times has a Christian friend of yours given you a quote from Jesus where you're like, you know what, I love that. Because rationally and because you'd think that a prophet like Isa would say something like this isn't that true so likewise when the Quran says tell the people of the Injil to judge by the Injil it could be because the people of the Injil have enough of a text for them to judge amongst each other that's why you find discussions among certain scholars of a particular text if you want online my dear brothers sisters at home you can read it and the idea that the Arab Christians in that early period had a gospel of harmony known as the Diatessaron. And that the Ebionites may have been amongst those who followed that particular gospel where they believed in God. They believed in the oneness of God. They believed Prophet Isa was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
They did not necessarily subscribe or were affected by certain Trinitarian beliefs, which possibly could have been the cause of their persecution many years later. So now, when someone says to me, when the Quran says, ask Ahlul Injil, that means the Injil of the time, no way could the Injil have been corrupted? No. You could easily have an Injil that's present that has more than enough within it for you to be able to use it. Someone says, That doesn't mean when it says that the example of the companions of the Prophet is in the Torah and the Injil. It doesn't mean that I have to find the Torah and Injil in its origin. It could just be telling me that these are the types of people who are described in the Bible. That's it. It's not necessarily referring me to look within the Bible. Rather, it's telling me that before them, there were people who lived like them. That's number two. Number three, someone says, لا تبديل لكلمات الله. No one can change the words of Allah. It doesn't mean that no one can alter Allah's revelation. It means when Allah gives you a word about something, He always fulfills it. If Allah tells you that now, if you do good deeds, You'll go towards heaven, and if you do bad deeds, you'll go towards hell. None can change. The word of Allah, the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah promises you, if you're obedient to your parents, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after you. Allah promises you, if you show akhlaq to your fellow human beings, then you are the highest in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't mean that the Bible and the Torah will never ever be changed. Rather, what it means is that when Allah makes a promise, Allah fulfills that promise. His kalima is always a truthful kalima. Yes? Never does anyone doubt his word. Therefore, the objections which were raised last night were these verses. These verses, we replied to them. Now, why do I, as a Muslim, not necessarily believe that the Bible is the word of God? Me, personally. Where does it come from? Each of you at home may have your different reasons, yes? All of you at home may have your different reasons. You may come up with a whole host of reasons. Why do I not believe? I said that when I looked at the way the Quran was revealed as a Muslim, God, unlettered prophet, illiterate prophet, whatever the terms you want to use, but around that prophet, there are disciples. These disciples are writing. And then from there, we have a standardized version of the Qur'an where the copies and the copies continue until today. With some variant textually, I must admit, I cannot turn around as a Muslim and say the Qur'an of 1,400 years ago until today. Could there be a question about some variants of readings of the Qur'an? Possibly, possibly. Until today, there are Muslims I've seen. When I pray Salat al-Jama'ah, I hear some say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm al -Din. And I've heard some who say, Maliki Yawm al -Din. So can I say that the Muslims were all in agreement about the word Maliki or Maliki? But that's different from a textual variant where a whole section of a story is in one Quran and not in the other. Now, when I'm looking at the Bible, let me try and understand the Bible. For everybody at home, we gave a brief introduction to trying to understand the Bible. We said the Bible is made up of J the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. We agreed on all of that. We discussed yesterday the Jewish Bible. And we said, you can remember it in the split of the Torah, and the Nevim, and the Ketuvin. We've agreed on that. That is the Old Testament. When we're coming to the New Testament, you ask any Christian, you want to understand Jesus' life, ask any Christian, they will not refer you to the Old Testament because the Old Testament in reality is not going to be clear cut in saying that Jesus is to come. You have to infer within the Old Testament about Jesus. Where do I find out about Jesus then? If I want to understand Jesus now from the Bible, I'm going to go to the New Testament, yes? I said earlier that it's already been agreed that this New Testament and what we have today, they are all in agreement on it the day Jesus died? No. 10 years after he died? No. 50 years after he died? No. Rather, a few hundred years after he died, 
the church leaders come to an agreement that these are the books that could be called the Bible. What are the main books which are always mentioned? Whenever you hear a Christian, he'll always say to you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't we always hear that? We always hear gospel according to Matthew. The gospel according to Mark. Even though Mark is earlier than Matthew. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, I said Ali ibn Abi Talib was writing when the Quran would be revealed to the Prophet. The Prophet would look at Imam Ali, for example, and say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif, Lam, Mim, Alif, Lam, Mim. And then he would say, next to him, he would say, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayu al-qayyum. Imam Ali would write, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayu al-qayyum. The beginning of Surah Al-Imran. And then it would say, Nazzala alayka al-kitab. Then Imam Ali would write, نَزَّلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ بِالْحَقِّ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَأَنزَلَ الْتَوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Imam Ali would write this. I trust the Qur'an because I know Imam Ali is a contemporary of who? Of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Forget my other opinions about Imam Ali's position. Because enough for me that Ali ibn Abi Talib writes the Qur'an with the supervision of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, I trust the Qur'an. I don't deny that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa died, Qur'an goes to Kufa, Basra, Cairo, whatever. There's going to be variants in certain readings that exist. When it comes to the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke is a companion of Paul. Luke is a companion of who? Paul. That means is he a disciple of Jesus? No. These books, for example, when I see John, who uh, John gave the title to the book, or for example, a couple of centuries later, they placed names of these people on the books. Our surahs in the Quran, by the way, when Surat Al-Imran was revealed, there was no such thing as called Surat Al-Imran. That came later. It wasn't revealed, oh, assalamu alaikum everyone, we've got news, there's a Surah called Al-Imran. No, it comes later. They name it later. Same way with the Bible. But the difference is that the four who are mentioned when it comes to the Bible, I'm looking at their versions. And I see Matthew copies from Mark. Mark is taken from Peter. Luke is a companion of Paul. John, there are a number of different variants of John. Even some reaching a level of five. This Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, of course someone can come and tell me, but they were inspired and so on and so forth. But I'm seeing that these aren't necessarily contemporaneous to Jesus السلام, what I'm seeing is that Luke is the companion of Paul I'm seeing that Matthew copies from Mark and that Mark is taking from who from Peter for example if the chapter was called gospel of Peter it would be a different story if the chapter was called the gospel of Peter who at the beginning when I open the New Testament I don't see Peter or James or Simon, I see straight away Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if Matthew is taking from Mark, if Matthew is taking from Christ, it's different. Matthew takes from where? Copies from Mark. Mark is from where? It's taking from Peter. Luke is a companion of Paul. And on top of that, all of these names were added onto these particular chapters a couple of hundred years later to say that this is attributed to be there versions that doesn't fill me with confidence i must admit rather if you tell me the quran and i see for example the first person to have written the quran was 120 years after the prophet or 90 years after the prophet then i'd have question marks yes hence amir al-mu'minin salam straight away writes the quran and doesn't leave his house until the quran is complete and the holy prophet has that confidence to say i leave behind for you the quran I leave behind for you the Quran and my progeny. Or the Holy Prophet, 
Or as Umar himself said, the Quran is enough for us during the life of the Prophet. That means the Quran is compiled there during the life, according to certain scholars, of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Now, so I've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These guys were best friends of Jesus, walking around with him everywhere. Or rather, I see Matthew take from Mark, and Mark is taken from Peter, and Luke is a companion of Paul. How then do I take all of this? That's number one. Number two, what second thing doesn't make me believe that the Bible, in its entirety, I'm saying, I believe certain parts of the Bible which is with us today is from God. But I'm saying in its entirety, what is it that makes me believe the Bible's not the word? Of, second thing is translations always cause havoc. Quran, what's its language? Arabic. Arabic, everybody will know the Quran inside out, even from your Indonesia or you're from Bangladesh. And Allah is proud when he mentions that we revealed it an Arabic Quran. When I'm living there at the time, and I am seeing Greek translations take place, how many changes can occur and mistakes can occur in these translations? The Hellenic community has a major influence on the translations of the Bible. And then it's translated into, for example, Georgian, and Slavonic and translate into different languages, it causes problems. Number three, a third problem that I face when I'm looking at the Bible, what is it? The first, third problem is when these scribes are trying to make copies of the Bible. These scribes who are making copies, at that time we don't have publishing houses and printing houses, do we? At that time we don't have that. Oral memorizers, in some cases, make less mistakes than a person who's a scribe. A person, sometimes his oral memory, spot on. But when it comes to scribe and copying, sometimes when we're copying a book, we'll make a mistake without realizing. But when we're trying to memorize something, we'll clock straight away if I've missed a particular word in an eye of the Quran. Now, at that time, for example, in Rome, 90% of the people, let's say, were illiterate. And these people are not writing. 10% are writing. Who said these 10% are the best of writers? A person comes, for example, from a land like Antioch or a land like Ephesia or a Smyrna and they want to take a copy of this Bible. They want to copy it and take it there. What's going to happen? What's going to happen is that there's going to be what? There's going to be discrepancies. There's going to be differences. There's going to be textual variants that are going to occur from those oldest manuscripts all the way until today. There will be textual variants. Even if you tell me 5,700 Greek manuscripts we have, we'll still find that there will be textual variances that will exist. Why? Because of human error. I as a human, if I see a story in the Hashia, I may want to include that story. But that story was not part of the Bible. But I'll say I'll find a place for it in the Bible. And that's why you find John Mill at Oxford a few hundred years ago. John Mill collected, he was trying to collect, bring together the New Testament. A hundred manuscripts. Do you know how many discrepancies and variants he found? 30,000. A hundred manuscripts of the New Testament. 30,000. I'm not talking 5,700 manuscripts. I'm talking 100 manuscripts. And I find how many discrepancies and differences and inconsistencies John Mill found at Oxford a few hundred years ago. 30,000. Someone says, what do you mean when you say that there are textual variants in the Bible and discrepancies? What I mean is, if I want to write my version of Jesus' mission, I want to then superimpose what I want Christianity to look like in the way that I write. Isn't that true? There's a difference between Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, writing the Quran and someone coming 200 years later putting his own things into the Quran. When I know that there is a ma'soom, an infallible, who is supervising the writing of this book, it is different from having somebody who all of a sudden sees a vision and that now he is guided by Jesus and now he wants to superimpose. That's why you see in the Christian world, Peter and Paul cannot stand each other. Peter, what did we say earlier? We said earlier, Mark takes his from Peter. Peter is huge in Christianity. Paul is the highest name you'll see in Christianity. Those who tell you Jesus is the highest, wallah, I think Paul gives him a good run for his money. For a Jewish convert, mashallah, he done very well for Christianity. You found that Paul and you found that Peter 
loggerheads with one another. Why? Because one's going to superimpose his opinion and the other will superimpose his opinion. And hence, when I come to simple stories, simple stories in the Bible, if you look over a thousand years, you'll see how there are some stories that were not in the early manuscripts of the Bible. A thousand years later, they're there. Earliest manuscripts of the Bible. Even if you look at the Greeks and their earliest manuscripts, you'll find a story in the Bible. Let me give you four examples today. Four is sufficient for me to give today. I'm not going to give any more. Today, I'll look at John 7. And I'll look at Luke 2. Matthew 24 and the end of Mark. I'll look at these four. These are sufficient for me today to highlight why I may not reach a conclusion that the whole of the Bible is the word of God as we know it. John 7, famous story. Many of us have heard it. Wherever you go, you'll hear it. And it's actually a wonderful story, wallah, to tell you the honest truth. It's just a shame that it wasn't in the earlier Bibles but found it way in a thousand years later. Lady is dragged into the temple while Jesus is teaching. He's teaching in the Jewish temple. A lady is dragged in by the leaders or the scholars of Judaism. She has committed zina. The law of Moses is to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? That's a difficult one for Jesus. Why? Difficult one. The difficulty is you've come with a message of love and mercy. But we're going to see if you're really following Musa's law. What does Nabi Isa do? He stoops down. And it's as if he's looking onto the ground, writing. He says, the one who has not committed a sin, let him be the one who stones. All of us as humans, we have glass houses. It does la'na. On you, she doesn't wear hijab. She's telling you how you've ruined the message of Imam al Hussein. I said, well, do you go and wear hijab first so that Sayyidah Zainab will be happy with you and then teach me about Aba Abdullah as if I don't know much about him. Now, when the people throw glass, they throw stones, they have glass houses. You throw stones, glass houses. You want to throw stone at this girl? Which one of you has not committed a sin? Because I find people very interesting. When you don't do something in fiqh, then they throw stones at you. How many things of fiqh do you not do? Oh, that person, wallahi, you know that person is not the most religious person in the world. Why? Because that person, I saw him do this. Did you wake up for Fajr last night? Nabi Isa alayhi salam, what does Nabi Isa do? Nabi Isa alayhi salam, he says, the ones of you who has no sin, stone her. Suddenly, Everybody starts to leave. If she's committed zina, you want to stone her. What? Uh, tell me about your sins. Your ma'soom? Isa alayhi salam famously tells her. Is there anyone left? No. She go, he goes, then you know what? You won't do the sin again. Go repent and tells him. This story, John 7, with us in the early manuscripts is not there. Now how am I going to trust John when I see a story which in the earlier John is not there. But then later on, I find that the story is there. So here, I have John 7. I have another one, which is where? Luke 2. We said Luke was a companion of Paul. Luke 2. Luke 2, what does it refer to? Young Jesus, 12 years old. They've got, he's gone with his family to where? For a festival in Rome. When his family go home, three days, they realize, uh, oh, where's Jesus? Now, normally, look, some parents are absent-minded, Zoom, yes? Some parents are absent-minded, without a doubt, but three days, wallah, I'm not sure. When eventually they find Jesus, one version says that myself and your father were wondering or didn't know where you were looking for you they want to find him another says joseph and me so now i have two versions one mentions 
Me and the father. And another mentions Joseph and me. And here's a question mark. Why are there two different versions on this? Yes. Firstly, I thought it was a virgin birth. And so now the question mark is who Joseph is. So again here, you have a version that says, myself and the father, or your father and I, and the other mentions Joseph and I. Here's a second one. A third one, you come to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, what does it discuss? It discusses the end of time. None knows Yawm al Qiyamah, true? Who knows Yawm al Qiyamah? None knows Yawm al Qiyamah. Not even the sun. Oh, problem. None knows Yawm al Qiyamah. Not even the sun, only the Father. Problem. Hold on, hold on, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not even the sun, but then hold on a minute. What's going on if the sun doesn't? None knows Yawm al Qiyamah. Not even the sun. That means the difference between the knowledge of the sun and the knowledge of the Father. True? More if the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. So what's going on? So then not even the Son was removed in other manuscripts. Removed, not even the Son. Shinos Jaivin, what have you bought not even the Son here for? This causes a headache. I am looking at it. I'm seeing textual variants, but big difference. One says none knows the end of time, except two. Not even the Son, except the Father. The other says no, none knows the end of time, except the Father. The sun has gone because if I say there's a problem in the knowledge of the sun, then how do you have Father, Son, or Holy Spirit? That means that the sun lacks and the Father has. The Father is all knowledgeable, the sun is. Not. So you see? Another one, another interesting one is which one? Look how many variants there are. Imagine now someone bought you a Quran and he said to you, Wow, this is a sick story, Sayyidina. I'm like, you know, when the Quran was revealed, it wasn't there, but eventually it got there. And how did it get there? True, you'll ask that question. You're like, how did it get there? And the simple answer is, over time, this scribe may have found it, this scribe saw it in the margin, this one decided to include it, and that's why I cannot trust that the whole of the Bible can give me the real picture of Jesus. The last one I want to quote, which one? The end of the book of Mark. Mark's book, probably the shortest, it comes 16, chapter 16, 8. It ends where? Where does it end? 16, 8. Then suddenly, after 16, 8, in some copies of the Bible, there's double brackets, 9 till 20. Hold on a minute. Imagine tomorrow, you saw a surah, you saw a surah of the Quran, like Surah Al-Baqarah. Yeah? Surah Al-Baqarah. How many ayahs of the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah? 286. Imagine that you find a version that says, brackets, there's another 14 ayahs at the end. You're like, well, what is this? Appendix? What is this? They've added something? Added? What's going on? With Mark 16, 8, it normally it ends there. What does it end with? Jesus has been on the cross. <coughs> Jesus has died and um, he's been buried. And then you've got these ladies who come three days later. They come towards the tomb of Jesus. And what do they find? They find a man there who tells the ladies who are, of course, afraid. He tells them that you have to go and you tell the other disciples what's happened. Ends there. Just ends like that. Ends abruptly. Later, the story is not like this. The story, I have to fill it now. Ma, what's Mark saying? The story ends with the ladies seeing that Jesus' tomb, for example, is empty. And there's a man who says that you leave and tell. And that they don't go and tell the other disciples. They leave afraid. Yes, he tells them, you go and tell the people if they want to see Jesus, they go to Galilee and they will see Jesus and the whole idea. Mark ends at 16.8. Later, Mark has another 12 verses. They went to the disciples and the disciples went with the ladies and they went to Galilee and that's where they found Jesus. Why these have been added? For what reason? Why doesn't the story end at 8? Why doesn't the story just finish there? I find a copy of the Bible with no adultery story, then I find a copy with an adultery story. I find a copy of the Bible saying to me that no one knows the day of judgment except the Father, not even the Son. Then suddenly I see the Son has been deleted. I find a copy of the Bible where Jesus السلام, is talking about a father and his mom or Joseph and his mom. So you therefore find that these textual variants Cause the question mark that can I take the whole Bible 
Not necessarily, because it becomes a problem for me. I, as a Muslim, therefore, do I look down at the Christian because of the Bible? No, because I believe that the Bible still has a lot within it, which we can learn from. Tomorrow I'll examine the difference where some of the prophets in the Quran, some of the prophets of the Bible, there may be a difference in their stories which may lead further to me, not necessarily taking all of the Bible, but sufficient for me to say that within the Bible, there still remain teachings which were enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell the community, use the Injil. He was telling the, early, the Christian community in Medina, judge by the Injil. Why? Because within the Injil, whether it was a thousand years ago or today, there are still messages which are good for mankind. Messages which honor who? Which honor Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. And honor, for example, Nabi Ibrahim. Yes, we have differences in some of the stories, but there are still good messages of the way to interact with the Lord. And that's why you found in Islamic history that the Christians who loved God and who loved revelation and who loved prophets, their hearts would break if they saw anyone related to a prophet of Allah. Subhanallah, there are Christians in the world today. When they hear the story of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, they write poetry about Sayyid al-Shuhada. They write poetry about how even a person who shows extreme emotion for Abu Abdullah, that is not enough when a person realizes what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam went through in his life. And that's why it doesn't surprise me that on the plains of Sham, in the court of Yazid, Yazid had tried his hardest to bring people who would laugh at Al Muhammad, who would mock what Al Muhammad were going through. Amongst them, he had brought certain Christian ambassadors, certain Roman ambassadors. They were sitting next to Yazid. And Yazid, what was he doing? Poking the lips and the eyes of Imam Al Hussein, alayhi salam. Wallah, every year when I utter these lines, whether it's in Muharram or in Shah Ramadan, just the image of thinking of someone poking the lips of Imam al Hussein breaks the heart of every Muslim. He was poking the lips, poking the eyes. The Christian man who was next to him, he looked towards Yazid. He looked towards the ladies. He saw a lady in her 50s, but he saw a girl in her threes, fours, the youngest of girls in their infancy. He saw, for example, some girls who were in their teenage years. He began to ask a question because he noticed that these ladies had looked after themselves spiritually, modestly. He asked Yazid, he said, Yazid, who are these ladies? Why are they looking like they're in a state of fear? Yazid said to him, these are rebels. He said, but tell me who they are. He said to him, these are the daughters of Muhammad. When the Christian man heard the name of Rasulullah, he said to him, oh Yazid, is that the prophet of Allah that these people claim to follow? Yazid looked towards him. He said to him, yes, why do you say this? He said to him, oh Yazid, we had the footprint of the donkey of Isa alayhi salam in our village. Some people mentioned the footprint of the donkey of Dawood alayhi salam. We had the footprint of the donkey of a prophet of Allah in our village and we looked after it. We made sure that we honored it because it was a connection between us and the heavens. These are the granddaughters of the man who brought your people the message. How could you, O oh Yazid, chain them in this way? These are the granddaughters of a prophet of Allah. Yazid, when he heard this, he said to the man, he said to the man, how dare you speak like this? And he said to him, O oh Yazid, who is this head that you poke with your stick? He said to him, that is the head of Hussein, the son of Ali. The Christian man, upon hearing the name of Abba Abdullah, Begun to shed tears at that moment and said, And that is the grandson of your prophet. Yes, he looked towards the man. He said to him, Oh man, if you continue talking, then you'll be beheaded. Listen to the reply that the man gave. He said, Whatever you do to me, I don't mind. Yes, he said to him, Why? He said, Because I saw the mother of that man in my dream last night. I saw Fatima. Zahra in my dream last night. It doesn't worry me whatever you'll do 
to me as long as I'm with Al Muhammad. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Raise your hands, my dear brothers and sisters. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Allow us to be amongst his companions. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al Fatiha in honor of all of our marhumin and your marhumin. But before it, the loudest of your salawat. Allahumma salli ala. <laughs> I think it's everyone's dream to work and serve the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. Working with this project allows us to contribute back to the community. Our main objective is to bring Imam Hussein to every household or to take people to Karbala. Producers, cameramen and editors all synchronize to capture, inspire and bring you closer to Abu Abdullah. Working here is an honor and a privilege, yet nothing compared to the sacrifice of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Pass on the lantern of Imam Hussein. Why should you support? Why should you support? Why should you support? Imam Hussein TV is our Husseiniya to the world. It's an open university to learn theology, history, law, Quran, and many more sciences. Many rely on our channel as they have no access to any Husseiniyas or any mosques. And they have no access to any community events, nor scholars and they solely rely on our broadcasting. Children in the West have so many questions to ask about the faith. We aim to educate youth and reverts in a thoughtful manner and language which is interactive, easily digestible and understood. Our project is fully crowdfunded. We have no sales, no business, no profits. If you do not support us, who will? If you do not open a channel, who will? And if you do not raise the flag of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, who will? We have been operating since 2016 and we have brought to you shows like Morning Barakah, Ahkam SOS, Her Thoughts and The Debate Show. We also have created many documentaries on topics such as the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, miracles in Arba'een, non shias visiting Karbala, and most importantly, and most importantly, and most importantly, and most importantly, we bring you Karbala Live. Karbala Live. Karbala Live. Karbala Live. The Baker, Ya Hussein.